My name is Bert Massey, and I have been in the land title insurance business in Brown County, Texas for more than 40 years. In addition to which, I served as mayor of the city of Brownwood for some 26 years. As a consequence of those two activities, I've had the occasion to do a great deal of reading about the history of Brown County, and at the same time, have had an opportunity to interact with a number of people who were involved in some of the incidents relating to growth and development in Brownwood and Brown County, and in other instances have given speeches that required me to research the history of Brown County. And so the purpose today is to talk about what I know, some of which I remember, a lot of which I merely read about, as to the establishment of Brownwood in Brown County. It's my understanding that the first Anglos to come to the area of Brown County was a cavalry patrol led by Captain Henry Brown chasing Comanche Indians who had stolen some horses. The county, this happened in about 1856, and the county was not settled at that time. I think that's the last time Captain Brown ever set foot in Brown County. However, some years later, when the formation of Brown County was before the legislature, legend has it that Captain Brown's son was a member of the legislature, and at his insistence, we were named Brown County after Captain Brown. The earliest settler in Brown County was reputed to be a man named Welcome W. Chandler, and he settled on the other side of Pecan Bio from where the town of Brownwood is today, and the original courthouse was there. After that area flooded two or three times, a man named Greenleaf Fisk, who owned a great deal of land in Brown County as a result of being a veteran of the Texas Revolution, gave to the county the current location where the Brown County Courthouse is located. And here goes the development of the county. It was primarily an agricultural center. It was a trading center with a number of towns in Brown County, most of which have now disappeared, who came to Brownwood to bank, to sell their goods, uh, stayed in wagon yards and the few hotels that were here. A number of incidents took place that are historical. The deputy sheriff of Brown County was killed in Comanche County by the famous gunman uh, John Wesley Harden a deputy sheriff, or the sheriff, I think, was killed by someone he intended to apprehend in one of the Brownwood hotels, and the fugitive shot through the door and killed him. Brown County also managed to survive the famous fence-cutting wars, which took place with the invention of barbed wire and the doing away with open-range grazing, which had been the method of raising cattle in Texas for many, many years. At one time, the Coggin brothers, who headquartered out of Brownwood, were the largest cattle operators in what is called the Rolling Plains. Most of it on leased land or on open range, some land they owned themselves. The early prominent settlers were Brooke Smith, uh, S.R. Coggin, uh, the, uh, the owners of the First National Bank, uh, the owners of the Citizens National Bank, several other banks that were in town. These were community leaders in the late 1800s. Some of them lived into the early 1900s. With the advent of the possibility of the building of a railroad, a group from Brownwood went to Galveston and spoke to the owners and operators of the Gulf, Colorado and Central Railway Company. And uh, they offered land and other inducements for the Gulf, Colorado, and Santa Fe is the correct name, to come through Brown County. And sure enough, that's what happened. So Brownwood, close to the turn of the century, was a commercial center. It was a center for agricultural producers to sell and trade and store their goods. And because the railroad came through, the depot was constructed, and that was the method by which uh, goods and services were shipped into Brownwood and shipped out of Brownwood. With the Great Depression, Brownwood suffered like every other place uh, in the United States, and it was particularly difficult, I'm told, in Texas because of drought conditions that also existed. A number of financial institutions went broke, uh, never to recover. 
and it was determined with what apparently was the coming of America's entry into World War II, uh, that there were going to be a number of Army training bases uh, in Texas uh, that were not currently there. So a deputation of the Brownwood Chamber of Commerce, led by a man named Bob Holly, so I am told, went to see the commanding general at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, which was then the military headquarters for the United States, and uh, tried to induce him to establish an army training base in Brownwood. I'm told that initially the idea was land would be leased to the army for the training base. Somehow, and I don't know how, that group managed to persuade the landowners of 99,000 acres of land to lease their land to the U.S. Army. Having gone to all that work, the Army then decided they wanted to own the land. And so the U.S. Army acquired 100,000 acres in Brown and Mills County for the purpose of building what became known as Camp Bowie. In World War I, Camp Bowie was located in Fort Worth along where, strangely enough, Camp Bowie Boulevard is currently located. The coming of Camp Bowie to Brownwood was an unbelievable change to this community, so I'm advised. I was around during Camp Bowie, but having been born in 1943, I really was not paying a whole lot of attention at that time to the impact it might have had on the community. There are pictures of Center Avenue in Brownwood at the time of Camp Bowie, and the cars are bumper to bumper and parked bumper to bumper up and down both sides of the street. 80,000 soldiers, I'm told, trained at Camp Bowie. The first commander of Camp Bowie was a general named Walter Kruger, who went on to command the 8th Army in the Southwestern Pacific Campaign under General Douglas MacArthur, and it is Kruger's 8th Army that did the invasion of the Philippines and the reconquest of the Philippines, taking it away from uh, the Japanese. At any rate, someone told me it wouldn't rain at all prior to the construction of Camp Bowie and then it wouldn't quit while construction was taking place. You can imagine the impact as all of those facilities were built at Camp Bowie and uh, the materials with which to build them had to be purchased from somewhere. Uh, I think the diaries of Lisey Watson who then ran Wickley Watson Hardware Company indicate that the Army would place an order with Wickley Watson for, let's say, several hundred refrigerators. And Wickley Watson would order the refrigerators, they would be drop shipped from the manufacturer to Camp Bowie. Wickley Watson would never see them, but they would be paid for the refrigerators by the U.S. Army. Uh, Brownwood was dry during the period that Camp Bowie was here. And, uh, of course, soldiers wanted liquid refreshment uh, when they were on leave or on had a pass for the weekend. So the community obliged by the, there were many drugstores in town at that time, probably 10 or 12. I think one man owned seven alone. And each one of those drugstores kept a doctor on retainer. And the doctor would often find it necessary to prescribe uh, a pint of whiskey for a cold or a cough or some other difficulty. I once had a client who told me the story of a friend calling him and telling him that he had a slight cough and wanting to know if my friend would go by the pharmacy and pick up a pint of whiskey for him, which he did. The doctor wrote out a prescription. The man then, my client, put it in the inside pocket of his coat and went to Sunday school and church at First Baptist Church. And then after he went out to eat, he delivered that pint of whiskey. Well, I knew the man and his wife very well, and if something had happened that had caused that whiskey bottle to break while church was going on, my friend's wife would have killed him, but nothing happened. I'm also told that soldiers and business people who uh, migrated into Brownwood uh, wanted other types of entertainment. So at the various hotels, some of which are long gone, I'm told it was very easy to find a game of chance if you wanted to play a little card, uh, poker that is, or prepared to shoot craps or something of that nature, and that there was sidebar entertainment, one could find some liquid refreshment there, and uh, perhaps female companionship. The Dixie Hotel on 
extended all the way through from Baker Street to Fisk Street. And I'm told that the Dixie Hotel was a center for all of those activities. Across the street from our office is a building, the top of which was a hotel at that time. And uh, that's the second story, and it had an outside stairway. And I'm told that the beds were turned in that hotel on a regular basis, probably every 30 minutes. And that on a weekend, the soldiers would be lined up from the door of the hotel, down the stairs, all the way back down South Broadway to Main Street uh, for the entertainment that happened to be available there at the hotel. Uh, there were any number of men's clothing stores, ladies ready to wear. It was impossible to find a place to rent. Uh, people rented spaces in their homes to uh, officers' wives who came to be with their spouses at Camp Bowie. My father, for example, never cared anything about owning a house. He preferred to rent one, but he bought the house that I was raised in as Camp Bowie was coming because he knew you weren't going to be able to rent with the Army here. At the close of World War II, many of the Army bases that had been major training facilities were going to be closed. Uh, the government determined, obviously, that we did not need the size Army that we had put together to fight the battles in both the Pacific and in Europe in World War II. And, of course, soldiers were ready to come home and get on with their civilian lives. There was a choice, so legend has it, to be made between keeping Camp Bowie and another military installation that had been established at Killeen called Camp Hood. Supposedly, Senator Tom Conley, who was the longtime senator from Texas and the senior senator, could make the call as to where the permanent military installation would be. And for reasons that are unknown to history, Senator Tom Conley decided we would keep Camp Hood. I don't know what it benefited him. He was from Marlin, as I recall. But at any rate, Camp Bowie was closed. And shortly after 1945, some of the land where the administrative area was, the, the barracks, the mess halls, the movie theater, the swimming pool, and the training grounds, uh, marching grounds, and so forth, was declared surplus. And it was sold to buyers, including buyers representing uh, the Brownwood Chamber of Commerce through a subsidiary organization. But not all of the camp was sold off. The maneuver area, the most of the 100,000 acres, was offered back to sale to the ranch owners from whom it was acquired. But a part, a big part, of the administrative area was kept. And with the advent of the Korean conflict, uh, there was a fear that the Army would have to be mobilized again, and so the Army put in some new sewer lines and new water lines and a water pressure tank uh, at Camp Bowie, but armistice was declared or a ceasefire in Korea before the camp could be activated. Finally, in 1964, Brownwood having suffered through, in this area, the closing of the camp and the Great Drought, the government decided to declare the entire administrative area surplus. And an auction was to be held for the land unsold in the administrative area. Supposedly, this is legend, one man from Brownwood knew somebody with the General Services Administration and arrangements were made so that certain tracts of land would be, Brownwood would have the successful bid for. And whether that was true or not, enough of the land in the administrative area of Camp Bowie was bought by the forerunner of the Brownwood Industrial Foundation so that the Industrial Foundation was the market maker as to the price of land in the administrative area now called the Brownwood Industrial Park. Shortly after the purchases were made, uh, I understand that Governor Conley John Conley was in the hospital in Parkland, at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, having been wounded in the assassination of President Kennedy, and that Ben Barnes, who then represented Brown County in the legislature and was the Speaker of the House, and his wife were looking after the Conley children, and that uh, Speaker Barnes asked the governor 
if he would call the chairman of the board of 3M, then called Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, and ask him to select Brownwood for a plant that was going to be located in this part of the world by 3M. Uh, how much influence Governor Conley had in that decision, I have no way to know, but in fact the 3M plant was located here and it's been expanded many times and now has a workforce, I'm told, of about 650 people. About the same time, Brownwood Mayor Bill Monroe was going to take a trip to North Carolina to see his family and he decided to drop by the headquarters of Superior Cable Company which was also in North Carolina. The Industrial Foundation had been dealing with Superior Cable, but had not been able to consummate a transaction where Superior would locate a plant. At any rate, whatever Mayor Monroe did or said resulted in Superior Cable agreeing to build a facility in Brownwood, or in the industrial area. And that facility now is larger than it ever has been has a workforce, I think, of about 450 people and is owned by LG Electronics uh, out of South Korea, manufactures copper and wire cable for the telephone industry and had the first fiber optics manufacturing line in the state of Texas. Because the land was available in the early 70s, the Kohler Company was going to locate a facility in Texas and the Industrial Foundation offered to give the land to Kohler if they would come and look. Supposedly they were not looking anywhere east of Interstate 35. At any rate, Mr. Kohler liked the location and uh, the co first Kohler plant was built, which has been expanded and is now, I understand, 26 acres under one roof, the largest ceramic plumbing manufacturing facility under one roof in the United States. And Kohler Company purchased a plant, FMC Corporation, built in the industrial area, then closed, and now operates a facility there as well, and employs between the two facilities, I'm told, about a thousand people. Other industries have located smaller in the industrial area, 25, 50, 150 employees, and that industrial park, for the most part, constitutes the industrial employment base not only for Brownwood but for Brown County and surrounding counties as well. A big percentage of the industrial park workforce comes from out of town. And we continue to support that industrial park and work with it. The city does, I know, uh, every day. So we're very proud of it and happy to have it. Now let me step back a minute. Uh, I got excited about getting into Camp Bowie in World War II and I overlooked the building of Lake Brownwood. Water for the city of Brownwood was taken out of the Pecan Bio and filtered in a filtration plant in the early part of this century, of the 19th century. Uh, and filtration facilities, it could be seen up until recently, uh, just at inside the entrance to Riverside Park. Flooding occurred with the streams, Adams Branch and Willis Creek that go through Brownwood. And if the bio was down, water was not absolutely guaranteed. So it was decided that what would be the answer to flood control, as well as a guaranteed water supply for Brownwood and the surrounding area, would be to build a lake on the confluence of the Jim Ned Creek and the Pecan Bio. Once again, a committee of the Chamber of Commerce was formed and an application was made to what was then called the Texas Board of Water Engineers, a three-person board, for a permit to build a dam at the confluence of Jim Ned Creek and the Pecan Bio and to capture up to 250,000 acre feet of water. This created great controversy. Of course, anybody that was opposed to that application could appear and testify. At that time, entities owned, I'm told, by Samuel Ensel out of Chicago, who owned one of the two great electrical power supply and delivery networks in the United States, had a contract to build the dams on the Highland Lake, 
uh, lakes uh, down the Colorado from where Pecan Bio entries, empties into it. And so they opposed it. Brownwood was an early member of the West Texas Chamber of Commerce, and the West Texas Chamber of Commerce waded in on the side of Brownwood. The long and the short of it is the Board of Water Engineers voted two to one to give the Brown County Water Improvement District number one, created by the legislature, a permit to entrap, I believe, 125,000 acre feet of water by building a dam at the confluence of Pecan Bio and Jim Ned Creek. The, the member of the board who voted no, I am advised, voted no because he wanted to make the permit for the requested 250,000 acre feet. That had been the case. If we'd gotten a permit that big, we'd have had water backed up to Abilene. And I'm sure we wish we had it in this drought period we're undergoing at the present time. At any rate, it's the late 20s. Uh, engineering is done to determine how much land will be taken up for the lake. It's acquired either by condemnation or by negotiation. The dam is built, the bonds are sold to finance it just before the Great Depression breaks. And those bonds, incidentally, ran and were paid off in 1965. And since that date, the Water District has not collected taxes. It has existed on water sales. Shortly after the lake was built, big rain fills up. Everything looks great. The rice farmers down the Colorado needed water, petitioned the Brown County Water Improvement District for some. The district agreed to sell some. And initially, that dam had two floodgates in it. And you could open those floodgates to let water out. So what they did was open them halfway, and they got stuck uh, with the hydrology of water. At any rate, they couldn't close them, and it drained the lake. And everybody thought it was the biggest disaster that would ever hit Brownwood. The gates were closed and welded in place after the lake was drained. And sure enough, in a short period of time, another great rain came, and the lake filled back up. Now, we could use another one of those great rains today to get the lake over half full and filled back up in this time of drought. In the 1970s, the delivery system of water from Lake Brownwood to the filtration plant on Round Mountain, which is also owned by the Water District, fell apart. Part of it was an open concrete ditch and it fell off the side of a hill and the water supply to the filtration plant was interrupted. As a result of that, the work went forward. It took several days to repair the delivery system. An emergency system was put into Pecan Bio, running from it to the filtration plant. And with grants and bond sales, the dam was built up, reinforced, underground pressurized delivery system put in place from the lake to the filtration plant and a new filtration plant was built. The water district sells treated water to the city of Brownwood, which in turn sells it to its customers. It has previously sold raw water to the city of Early, which filtered it and then sold it to its customers. But within a very short period of time, Early and Zephyr Water Supply Corporation will together be receiving treated water via a new pipeline from the filtration plant. The city of Bangs buys filtered water from the water district, as does Brooksmith Water Supply Corporation, which is a rural water supply district. And the district has recently completed construction of yet another new phase of the filtration plant. So Brownwood is very fortunate to have the water supply that it has. It didn't stop flooding because we have flooded since then, but not nearly so often as they experienced prior to the construction of the dam on Lake Brownwood. At the time, the initial plants were located, switching back to the industrial area. The tax rate per $100 of property evaluation as I recall, in the city of Brownwood, was something like a dollar sixty-four cents. 
Today, it is around 79 cents a hundred. That is reflected by the industrial employment base, payments in lieu of taxes that the industries, which are outside of the city limits, make to the city in return for guaranteed non-annexation into the city limits, and of course, a property added to the property tax rolls, water sales by the city, and the fact that Brownwood has continued and early to grow and develop, to maintain an employment base which allows those who are here to make a decent living, those who are raised here to come back here and make a de decent living, whether it be in the professions, whether it be in retail, whether it be an industrial job, or anything of that nature. The other thing that I might mention, we still have some of, and that is oil production. The first oil well in Brown County was hit north of Lake Brownwood in the teens or early 20s on land owned by a man named J.H. Fry, about at a formation about 300 feet deep. The, that expanded exponentially. We had refineries along Main Street, U.S. Highway 377. We had major producers like Humble Oil Company taking leases and building pipelines. We had major independents like Tom B. Slick of Oklahoma City and Charles B. Urschel, the man who was kidnapped in the 30s by Machine Gun Kelly and uh, who was with the ransom being paid by E.E. E. Kirkpatrick of Brownwood who'd gone from manager of the Chamber of Commerce to a very successful oil man. At any rate, there was a great deal of leasing and a lot of production, all of it shallow. Production remains north of Lake Brownwood in the area of Thrifty, in the area of Deer Bangs, and in the northeast part of the county near May. And that provides another economic base uh, for this county. And having said all of that, unless there's something else you want me to talk about, I think that I've exhausted my repertoire of uh, stories about Brown County and its history.